thank you both for taking time out of your very busy days to talk about the Middle East. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, General Zinni. I think that uh, one thing I would suggest is uh, we, we are in a, a very different sort of uh, uh, situation today than we were uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. And uh, I, that's not really reflected in the questions that, uh, that you sent for. I think that uh, if General Zinni is okay with that, I think at I some point we need to just uh, basically understand what where we are today and what the issues are today because i think uh, those that would give us uh, a platform to to talk about things that are old and things that are new well that's a terrific idea what well, then why don't why don't we start there if that's okay so why don't we start with you know what you just talked about ambassador sort of what's happening in the middle east uh, as of today, and uh, what has sort of changed? Uh, would you like to take a stab at that, Ambassador? Um, uh, I'll be happy to take a stab at it, but I, I think that General Zinni probably has uh, more up-to-date uh, information than I, but from standing my standpoint, I think that the situation we're, we're facing today is so different. Makes my, my head spin to look at the difference of, basically of the years that I spent in the Middle East and where we are today. Uh, we have uh, a situation in which our so-called traditional allies uh, are not responding as they have been in the past to what we consider very, very important issues. I mean, the, uh, the fact that uh, Russia is invading Ukraine and, had, and has, that kind of uh, knock on effect on oil prices and oil supply. And our traditional friends uh, in Saudi Arabia and the UAE don't really want to discuss the question of uh, increasing oil production to ease the pressure around the world. Uh, that I think is, is something that is, uh, uh, is, is shocking. Um, the, the other thing that is happening from what I can see is that uh, the loss of faith in the US as a security partner uh, is, is becoming uh, very, very uh, widespread in, in the region. Um, that has resulted, I mean, that of course uh, has stemmed from uh, our situation in Afghanistan and other failed interventions by the US. Um, but that was, uh, we have a, a, a situation now where the, the region is taking a different approach to settling its old uh, issues more uh, trying to settle them themselves than getting the U.S. to help them uh, or to back their, uh, back their activity. If you look, for example, at uh, what the UAE and Bahrain have done in reaching out to Israel, uh, we also know that uh, the states in the region uh, in various degrees, uh, have opened conversations with Israel. And those are just some of the, the couple of the issues that have been very, very uh, strikingly different from what uh, I experienced when I was in the Middle East. I don't know how you see these things, General, but uh, that is, uh, those are things that I, I think uh, we should all be aware of and, uh, and, and take uh, a good look at. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, General Zinni, what, what's your thought on that, sir? Well, I think the Ambassador is absolutely correct. Uh, our relationships out there and the situation in the region is much different 
for a number of reasons. And I would begin with the Arab Spring. When the Arab, Arab, Arab Spring seemed to uh, erupt on the streets of the Tunisia, then Egypt, and it was like a chain reaction, I think the, uh, the, the old uh, leadership really felt strongly that the U.S. would stand by uh, loyal allies, uh, not understanding that uh, we could not stand in the, in the way of democracy or freedom of speech. Uh, I think uh, at that time, Secretary of State Curry said, uh, we cannot not be on the side of the people. So we were very reluctant, for example, to support Mubarak or some of the other leaders that uh, felt they were getting uh, overwhelmed by forces coming off the street that they felt had foreign influence or extremism at their roots. And we looked at it as possibly a, a, a desire to move toward democratization in some way. So that sort of soured and was the beginning in my mind. I think the decision uh, by the Obama administration to pivot to the Pacific was seen in that region that the pivoting was away from the Middle East, that we really were now putting more emphasis in China and the Far East for economic reasons, security reasons, and it was going to be at their expense. Uh, and many of them believed that. And to a certain extent, it, it, we were getting tired of the conflicts and the events in the Middle East. And there was a strong desire in Washington to look elsewhere and minimize our involvement, especially uh, military involvement. I also think that our dealing with Iran really further degraded the relationship. Uh, the, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia felt strongly that when we cut the nuclear deal, they weren't invited to the table. Uh, this was all done with uh, the six plus one, which really didn't bring any countries from the region into the negotiations. And I think they felt strongly that uh, they should have been there. They were they stood up with us uh, opposing Iran, and then they felt we betrayed them and went behind their back. Uh, lately, I think, uh, you know, the attacks in the UAE from the Houthis in Yemen, us not uh, I think standing up in their eyes to condemn the Houthis really soured them uh, in an effort to sort of get even with us. They, they did not vote to condemn Russia for the attacks in, uh, in, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, the UAE that actually had the chair at the Security Council abstained on the first vote, uh, which was, I think, uh, really a surprise and you know, really uh, caused a great stir in, in, in our relationships. Obviously, uh, there are things that happened out there that we found difficult. The invasion of Yemen was one of them. Uh, I think also uh, uh, the event where uh, uh, the, the journalist Khashoggi was uh, brutally killed by what clearly is a move from Saudi leadership made that relationship go south pretty quickly. Uh, so I think when you look at these, and there's several other things that can come into play in this too, they began to look elsewhere, particularly China and Russia, uh, to see where you know, they could find more security, more, in their mind, stable economic interests. And you know, they open up a dialogue with Iran to a certain level. Uh, I would also say it's really important that we do not think of this region, which we often do, as monolithic. You know, that they're all Arabs, they're all Muslims, they all think alike, it's a great brotherhood. Uh, when you have experience out there, like the ambassador has, you begin to realize it's not that homogeneous or, or unified or monolithic kind of region. Uh, they have internal disputes. I was sent out by State Department uh, to try to resolve the dispute between four Arab countries known as the Quartet and Qatar, uh, which was pretty serious. Uh, and concerned us in terms of our military operations out there. They've always had difficulty in coming together and acting as a coalition against threats. Uh, we were able to piece together a coalition for the Gulf first Gulf War, uh, but that was based on the idea that poss possibly the Gulf Cooperation Council, the six countries in the Gulf plus Jordan and Egypt uh, would hang together and we would have some basis uh, for an organization, not quite like NATO, but a security relationship. 
I was also asked by the, administ the, the uh, administration, last administration, to try to go out in, and find interest in what was being proposed by us as a Middle East strategic alliance, uh, which we wanted to form based on how they saw structuring it. We offered you know, several areas of, of cooperation in this, one economic, one diplomatic, one security, and one energy. And we would build these pillars together uh, and, and initially start with the GCC plus two, but possibly look out at other countries. And uh, this uh, uh, did, not, did not sit well out there. They were, the interest level was far less than uh, I was surprised at, at how little interest there was in creating a, a greater cooperative structure for this. So those are just a few of the points, I think, that kind of get to what I think uh, Ambassador Keith is pointing to, which is very important, that this isn't the, the Middle East relationship we had uh, a few years ago. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you so much, General. A Ambassador, what do, you, what do you think about that? What, what was, do you have a follow-up, sir? I think uh, General Zeni has listed the key things uh, that have added up to a lack of confidence in where the U.S. is today, uh, as far as their security uh, partnership is, is concerned. Uh, I, I like the idea of, of focusing uh, on, on the Arab Spring, because the Arab Spring, uh, the, the uprisings that began in Tunisia, the general has referred to, uh, are, uh, the natural reaction to the fact that Arab leadership in virtually every case has been lacking. The governments really failed their people uh, over the years in, uh, in delivering what, the, the, what uh, their citizens want and need. And uh, there is no, no question that the weakness of the Arab governance structure was uh, illuminated in the Arab Spring. So uh, the question that uh, thinking uh, leaders in, in, the, in the region began to ask was what is the alternative to what we have? What is the, the what kind of Governor, governance should we be looking for? If you look at uh, the, the program of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood, or if you look at uh, the statements of Al Qaeda, uh, or if you look at the other uh, representatives of, of, uh, of different ideas on how governments should be organized, uh, you see that there are really important strains and uh, there really is almost nothing the United States can effectively do about that. Okay. Well, I'm curious, and that sort of leads into sort of the history of America's role in the Middle East. And I know, Ambassador, you started in the Middle East with the Foreign Service in the 60s, mid 60s. And obviously, we, we've talked about the change. But if we both could talk about you know, the initial influence of the United States in the Middle East, particularly after World War II, and again, your, your early experiences, and what, what our role was really like at that time, Let, let's say again, after World War II, up until your beginning service in the 60s and then you general. Ambassador? Well, I think that uh, I, when I look back on those years, I think in terms of a bipolar world, uh, the United States was uh, very uh, keen to limit the influence of the Soviet Union after World War II. We'd had the experience of uh, the, uh, the region being part of uh, international and, and broad conflicts in World War I and World War II. And we had by then developed uh, a, uh, a, a, a need for <laughs> uh, 
uh, the resources of the region that had not really existed before. Uh, the hydrocarbon re resources of the region. So a lot of the period after World War II was a, uh, a series of uh, acts and counteracts to limit the influence of the Soviet Union as far as the United States was concerned. Then in 1948, with the uh, formation of the state of the declaration of the state of Israel. Uh, that really changed the atmosphere uh, for in a, in a permanent way, I think. Uh, the United States had a reservoir of goodwill uh, in the Middle East. Uh, in, in various ways in 1950s, when uh, President Eisenhower uh, put pressure on our European allies uh, who had invaded the, uh, the Suez Canal area to take it over and the US forced them essentially to pull back. Well, that was a, uh, a major plus in the uh, annals and uh, as far as the uh, relations with the Arab world are concerned. And so we had some, uh, we had a good deal of, of, uh, of our uh, good, uh, goodwill reservoir was, uh, was, was working for us. And the, uh, as I say, the, uh, the influence of the Soviet Union was always uh, our, uh, one of our primary goals to make sure that we were, we had access to the hydrocarbon resources of the region. Thank you, sir. General Zinni, the, the role of the United States after World War II in the Middle East? Uh, well, I, I'll sort of take it from a, a security perspective. Uh, obviously, prior to World War II, the British and the French were the primary uh, influencers in the region. And of course, as a result of uh, uh, the end of World War II and the, the treaty and the, the uh, uh, Sykes-Picot agreement between the French and the Brits, it pretty much uh, got the region sliced up. Uh, 1945, we had uh, President Roosevelt, uh, as the war was winding down, meet with uh, King Abdulaziz of Saudi Arabia in the Great Bitter Lake aboard a cruiser. Uh, they cut the deal to form the uh, Arab American uh, Oil Company, uh, and our interest was oil. Uh, we did not worry too much about security because the British and the French basically uh, took that role, and the British especially in the Persian Gulf. Uh, 1970s hit, uh, and uh, the British no longer were capable of uh, being able to provide that security. So it kind of fell to the United States. And if you were around then, you can remember the oil shortage and the embargoes. Uh, as the ambassador pointed out, our, our relationships with Israel caused tensions in the region. And there was a deep concern about the security of the region, again, as the ambassador pointed out, because there was fear the Soviet Union uh, might look to stretch its influence, maybe even invade uh, that region of the world because of the resources, energy resources there. So uh, President Carter uh, uh, formed the Rapid Deployment Joint Task Force, uh, which under Reagan was to become the US Central Command as a, to put US forces in a position as a deterrence and uh, as a measure to ensure we could protect the region and focus on the, uh, the region. Uh, we began with uh, what was the, called the Carter Doctrine, which said we, we will defend those resources and those allies in the region, especially those that were, were oil rich, uh, the formal tru former trucial states and Saudi Arabia. Of course, uh, the beginnings were based on what was called the uh, twin pillars, Saudi Arabia and Iran, the Shah's Iran. Those were our two strongest allies in the region and the two most significant militaries be, beside Egypt, but in the Persian Gulf. Uh, Egypt at that time was uh, very much uh, 
uh, within the Soviet sphere. They had a close relationship with Russia. Their military re- was designed that way. Uh, later, Sadat was to kick the Russians out and, and create a better relationship with us. So that uh, twin pillars lasted until 79. 1979, the Shah falls. And now we have a problem in that we have a hostile Iran and a growing hostile Iraq. And we switched to a strategy that was called the uh, dual containment strategy. We had two potential adversaries in Iran and Iraq. Uh, we increased the presence in the region. Uh, the fifth fleet was, was formed uh, and, and we were able to move some forces into the region, which was a point of controversy. Uh, having Americans uh, based out there, even though it was minimal in the beginning, uh, there was uh, a lot of resistance uh, on, on the street and difficult for the leadership to uh, agree to it, but, but they did. And of course, that led up to the tanker wars and then eventually the, the first Gulf War uh, when we uh, uh, pushed Saddam out of Kuwait and then going into a containment of both uh, Iraq and, uh, 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 and Iran again. Uh, with more forces in the region. After the Gulf War, we were enforcing no-fly zones, no drive zones in Iraq, and had a significant greater presence of naval forces in the Gulf, uh, and eventually up to the second Bush administration when we decided that we would go into Iraq. And uh, uh, of course, that was uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, And in many ways, that caused problems in the region because They did not fear Saddam anymore. They really felt we had him contained. Uh, They did not like the idea that unlike the first uh, Gulf War, we did not get a UN resolution uh, to cover us in that, which they felt was critically important. And without it prevented them from being able to fully participate, although some did. Uh, The United Arab Emirates, uh, very bitter today because they provided forces to the U.S. in every conflict we've had, uh, you know, since we first built a re- uh, relationship with them, even though others in the region had not. That's why they feel they're being kicked to the side. And yet they've been with us in Afghanistan and Iraq and the first Gulf War, Somalia and elsewhere, and, and felt they've been uh, left abandoned. Uh, so we have a situation now. Uh, <laughs> up to the, where we started this with the Arab Spring, that where we once had very strong relationships, like our relationship with Egypt was probably uh, the strongest in the region. It is now in tatters. Uh, the UAE, a very strained relationship. They're very angry with us. Uh, the Saudis and uh, uh, Mohammed bin Sultan is, uh, you know, because of actions he did regarding uh, Kosoji and other actions, uh, we have distanced ourselves from him. Uh, if you look at the other countries in the region, they tend to now look elsewhere, uh, do not see the significance of the U.S. presence out there militarily, diplomatically, or economically. Uh, I had uh, a prime minister from one of the countries out there tell me one time that America's problem is the image of an American in that region of the world as a soldier in full combat gear. When you look at the image of someone coming from China, it's a businessman in a business suit ready to invest and ready to uh, have a relationship not based on the military. Uh, They also feel sometimes that our military actions are too rash, not that they don't necessarily agree that uh, we're dealing with people that are hostile to the the best situations in the environment in, in that region of the world, but they do feel sometimes that we overly tend to pull the trigger before we try to work through other resolutions. And also they feel that we kind of dictate, you know, the, how the relationships will go uh, and not really consult or bring them in. And I go back to what I said about the, uh, the, the nuclear deal with the Iranians. So that was kind of a quick history on the security okay. side. Uh, we still have a presence in the Gulf, uh, uh, let me, let me, let me just let me ask this. Let me, so ask, let me just ask this, sir, General Zinni, because I just wanted to ask this, because you mentioned about the two pillars, and I wanted to ask the ambassador, uh, a, if he could comment on some of the things you talked about. But I wanted to ask you about the, in retrospect, the the fall of the Shah of Iran. What kind of impact, Ambassador, do you feel that really had on the region, sir? 
Well, everybody was uh, affected by the fall of, uh, of the Shah, but uh, more specifically, they were uh, affected by a sort of Islamic revolutionary thrust uh, that took uh, its form in uh, attacks on uh, uh, the other Islamic regimes, other, uh, other Islamic countries, with uh, General Zani will certainly remember that uh, after 1979, uh, from Iran there were uh, there was this huge distribution of of cassettes uh, that went around the uh, the Middle East and especially in Saudi Arabia, where the uh, the family was attacked and the, uh, it, on both political and uh, religious grounds. So uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the fall of, uh, of the Shah, uh, the Re Islamic revolution that began with uh, Khomeini uh, Khomeini's return to uh, to uh, Iran from France uh, had a, a very important uh, internal effect uh, on the Arab world. Uh, when I went to Qatar, uh, for example, it was almost never that a uh, a, a Qatari uh, invitee would show up with his wife. Uh, before that revolution, uh, it was much more likely that you would interact with the entire family in Qatar. Uh, the, uh, the principal, his spouse, and, and, and his children. Uh, that may seem to be a small thing, but it was an immense change from what had happened before. We had uh, we looked across the, uh, the water to Bahrain. Uh, you could compare uh, Qatar and Bahrain's social patterns before 1979, uh, before the Islamic revolution. And uh, that has certainly been uh, a, a major change in the, in the region. The general has mentioned the, uh, the two pillars. Uh, it reminds me of the days when we were trying to explain in the diplomatic world, what we meant by dual containment. Uh, in fact, most, most of the people we interacted with out there would, thought it was a little silly and, and sometimes uh, a little funny, but dual containment, uh, that is the, the effort to contain the influence of both Iran and Iraq uh, was, was something that would be uh, impossible uh, with the kind of relationship we had with both countries. So anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> you ask about the uh, the impact of 1979, the, the Islamic Revolution and fall of the Shah, widespread and continuing. Yes. No, th thank you, sir. So both of you had mentioned, and I want to touch base on this, about Egypt. And historically, when you look at Nasser and then Sadat, and then sort of where we are today, but if we could talk about the evolution of America's relationship with Egypt, you know, starting with Nasser, uh, lack of relationship, and then uh, Sadat. General Zinni? Well, I think uh, we had a very uh, difficult relationship with Nasser. Uh, he, uh, he basically turned to the, the Russians, felt that he got more support from them than he did for us on projects like the Aswan Dam and elsewhere. And of course, uh, there was a strong sense of Arab nationalism then washing across uh, that part of the, the region. And uh, along with Assad in Syria, they formed the United Arab uh, Republic, uh, which did not work well and eventually uh, was dismantled. Uh, 
uh, when he was uh, when he died and Anwar Sadat took over, initially Sadat was very much uh, uh, with the Russians and the Russians were very strongly positioned in Egypt. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I think Sadat realized that it was in the best interest of Egypt to create a relationship with the United States and to uh, not and to disassociate themselves with uh, with Russia. Uh, so he very abruptly kicked out the Russians, uh, uh, entirely uh, attempted and over time was successful in shifting his military over to uh, U.S. style military, U.S. equipment. Uh, we were able to, uh, through the peace agreement that that he that uh, uh, he made with uh, Begin and uh, eventually with King Hussein, uh, he re there was a they were viewed the Egyptians and the Jordanians as very favorable here. So uh, there was a big uh, uh, economic advantage and security support advantage uh, for Egypt and and for Jordan as a result of the uh, uh, the three-way agreement uh, with Israel. Uh, it set a tone of hope. I think most people thought this might be the first steps toward a Palestinian-Israeli settlement. Of course, that did not turn out in the long run. Uh, and Sadat, up until his assassination, was very much supportive of the United States, very much saw himself as Western-leaning. Uh, when uh, Mubarak took over, the same thing, very positive. Uh, the, the uh, Egyptians, uh, for example, during the first Gulf War, provided the largest contingent uh, over a division size unit to the war effort to uh, remove Saddam from Kuwait. When we went to Somalia, they provided a brigade and a peacekeeping force and peace enforcement force down there. So the military relationship was going along very strong until we hit the Arab Spring. Okay. And I think, uh, as the ambassador pointed out, uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood winning the election because the moderates couldn't get their act together and get a single candidate. Uh, there were strong feelings that uh, we were too, I wouldn't say supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood, but too much geared to allowing them to uh, succeed. And, and of course, that backfired because the Muslim Brotherhood overstepped, tried to change the Constitution, uh, ran into a problem. People were back into the streets. The military felt compelled to, uh, for the first time, as they were very reluctant before, uh, to try to take power uh, and then eventually get to an election that obviously caused uh, General Sisi to become the, the president. Right. Um, all along, you know, we have felt that obviously we don't like to see militaries take over the government, although there was an election and by all accounts, CC did get the majority. Uh, that strained our relationship. And it's never really become positive or been, been reestablished to the level it was. Uh, in my recent or relatively recent trips to Egypt, I have never seen uh, the relationship that, that bad uh, and the feelings that bad and, and, and very visceral in terms of what happened. Thank you, General Zinni. So, Ambassador, I know you spent, you spent a lot of time in Egypt, sir. So asking you the same question, beginning with sort of the transition from Nasser to Sadat to Mubarak, what's sort of your take on that, sir? Well, absolutely. Uh, the general is, uh, has, has done a, uh, an excellent job in, in, in pointing to the, the historic ev evolution of our, of our relationship. One thing that I would, uh, would add is that uh, because the Egyptians moved uh, with Anwar Sadat, moved so uh, decisively to uh, improve their relationship with uh, Israel, um, the United States was grateful. And the United States showed its gratitude with an immense AID program. Uh, and also an immense uh, uh, program of, of military uh, assistance. Um, the, where we may have had a, a diplomatic failure is that the Egyptians, we let the Egyptians think that this was a reward for doing a, 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 a 
better deal with uh, with Israel than in the past. But what we should have done, perhaps, is made more of an effort to say, you are being uh, given this uh, particular AID relationship because you've demonstrated certain uh, uh, directions in governance. Uh, you have been uh, able to uh, open, uh, not completely, but open to some degree uh, the media uh, to uh, opposition voices. And uh, so that we would be rewarding you not just because you had uh, uh, made this step toward Israel, but because of these other factors, uh, or at least these other factors would be very much a, 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 a part of the whole picture. We haven't, haven't done that very well. So Egyptians basically feel that the money is their reward for doing what we want them to do. And uh, that is uh, when I was in Egypt, uh, the Egyptians, the Syrians, and the uh, Israelis were the, the largest recipient of USAID funding. I'd like to just follow up with you, Ambassador, and the, with you, General Zinni, sort of a what if. If, if Anwar Sadat is not assassinated and continues um, to run Egypt, is there a, a different dynamic that occurs, Ambassador? I think maybe that's the wrong question. Okay. Uh, I think if Rabin had not been assassinated, uh, there would have been much uh, greater uh, progress toward uh, a, a peaceful solution to the Middle East uh, conflict. I think he believed in his heart. He started out as a man who was just as, uh, just as, uh, as negative toward the Arab world as any of his colleagues. But he evolved over the years to a position where he thought uh, there there could be uh, a peaceful solution. And he basically gave his life for it. Um, that to me is, is one of the great tragedies of, uh, of the history of the region. But there were moments in that period leading up to the, the Camp David Accords and so on. There were moments when uh, uh, there were talks that were going on that were leading to very specific steps that would have been uh, a, uh, a major step in the right direction toward, uh, toward a Middle East peace. Um, there was one uh, instance when I was in Egypt when there was a quiet discussion ongoing about a meeting of, this, of the foreign ministers, including the Israeli foreign minister. And uh, I was in Syria at the time, and I was standing on the tarmac with uh, uh, the Syrian foreign minister as we were waiting for Kissinger's plane to arrive. And uh, they got a message while we were standing there and the foreign minister was absolutely ashen. Uh, he was so angry with, with the message. What had happened, of course, was that uh, Anwar Sadat had, uh, had gone public with the idea and said, basically, this is in the works. And this was before uh, any of the other sort of uh, what we used to call uh, the confrontation states were uh, fully on board. Okay. Syria was. And uh, there, that was uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I think back on 
is if that could have gone ahead, I think everybody was in the mood to make peace. Thank you, Ambassador. So General, I'm gonna follow up with you in terms of the, the question and then the re-question with uh, uh, Sadat and then Rabin. If, if Sadat had lived, what, what dramatic change might ha have occurred? And then if, uh, as the ambassador alluded to, uh, the assassination of Rabin was even more important. What are your thoughts, sir? Well, I completely agree with the ambassador. The key was if, if Sadat had lived, Rabin not assassinated, and at the same time, King Hussein still, you know, obviously in power, that group of three, uh, it is strongly possible that you might have achieved uh, some agreement or some move, significant movement toward a peace process that would work over time. Uh, I would add into the mix Shimon Perez, who was working with Rabin, uh, but you know, unfortunately, due to the assassinations of Sadat and Rabin, uh, we did not get the right mix that would have been, I think, able to move the process forward, maybe even complete some arrangement. Uh, having been involved in the peace process and, and obviously sent there by President Bush and, and uh, Secretary Powell, uh, there are a lot of missed opportunities. And with every missed opportunity, the situation gets worse. The borders become less defined, the settlements grow, uh, the hostilities uh, uh, and violence increase, and so it creates a, a, an atmosphere of bitterness, uh, and it makes it harder to find agreement on the final status issues that have to be agreed upon. And so, I, you know, I, I think the ambassador is absolutely correct. That would have been a moment in history when things could have been different, because that group were the ones that could probably most out of all of the history of this conflict could have made something significant happen. Yeah. Ambassador, do you have a, a follow-up, sir? No, I think that uh, one thing that, that you don't hear much about today, uh, but is significant and should be looked at more often is the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991. Uh, because uh, a reluctant Israel was dragged kicking and screaming to that conference. But uh, there was, a, that was a watershed moment. That was a moment when uh, there was an opportunity for uh, a, a new paradigm of uh, Middle East relationships to develop politically, economically, but face to face. Israelis and face, face to face with Egyptians, with uh, Syrians uh, and, and with the Palestinians. Uh, this was something that I, I was fortunate to be involved in because I was handling the, uh, the press side of things. And uh, it, just became such a natural flow of the discussions. You could see how things were working out on the, on, the, on the ground. And you could see that it was a natural movement toward a relationship that was not necessarily friendly, but productive between the Syrians, especially between the Syrians and the Israelis and between the Palestinians and the Israelis. They, we emerged from that 1991 uh, peace conference in Madrid with working groups in politics and security and with uh, and economics and in, in, in fields that we had never had that kind of cooperation. And uh, those things sort of took on a life of their own, and it, uh, it went on for, for some, some time. And it happened that I was in Qatar when we had the first uh, meeting of the Committee on Security and, uh, uh, on, on security and, and Political Development in the Middle East. Uh, and there they were. The, 
the, the whole group, including the Israelis, for the first time in, uh, in a sit-down meeting in the, of that kind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So both of you have mentioned Syria. So I'd, I'd like to talk about Syria for a minute, starting with you, General. Talk about the, the role of Syria in the region, uh, going back to Hafaz, Hafaz Assad and now the current Assad. You know, wh wh where is Syria sort of fitting in and what's happening in the Middle East, sir? Well, uh, obviously, Syria has maintained its connection with uh, first the Soviet Union and then Russia. Unlike Egypt, they did not sort of move toward the, the West. Uh, Assad, the elder Assad, was a brutal leader and uh, uh, exercised his rule in, in very violent ways. Uh, his his son now has done the same thing. Uh, and of course, when there was opposition and the uprising in Syria, you know, really began to take hold, they invited the Russians in. They brutalized some of their minority populations like the Kurds and several others that have, uh, you know, really bordered, I think, on genocide, uh, if not genocide. Uh, the, the, uh, the Russians, they invited in the same thing. Uh, it became home for ISIS for quite a while, or their base of operations. And in the in the mind of uh, uh, al, al Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, it was the center of the new caliphate that they he attempted to uh, build. So it's always been troublesome. It's been a uh, you know they use chemical weapons uh, on people as Saddam did, uh, and it remains this this kind of uh, pariah state that. Uh, is it adds to the instability. I, I, I would add that today we look at, uh, if you went to the U.S. Central Command and you asked about what's your mission, they would tell you, obviously, to, as Ambassador pointed out to, before, to maintain access to the region, freedom of navigation, and sort of the trade routes that go through there, which are significant east to west uh, through all the choke points. Uh, Babo Mandeb, Suez Canal, Strait of Hormuz, uh, also to uh, ensure stability as much as possible and try to build military alliances in some way. Uh, but each of those has been a difficult task. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the region tends toward instability and certainly has since uh, probably the end of World War I and, and as a result of the carving up of the region and in, in ways that uh, did not match the populations on the ground, the ethnicity uh, and the locations uh, that, that and places like uh, uh, where the Kurds are and elsewhere. And when the colonial era ended, it just exacerbated this problem. And we're seeing the impacts of that even today. Uh, and of course, you, you have a region that has a great difference in wealth and, and poverty. And so you see great, you know, energy based states like United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Qatar that do extremely well. And then other states that are in basically the populations in pretty close to abject poverty in many ways, Syria being one of them. Uh, and so you're constantly going to get the non energy based states, non rich states, large populations envious of those that have a strong economic base due to energy, smaller populations are able to please, uh, playing a bigger role on the world stage. And that conflict internally is, is always going to happen. Uh, that's why you have Syri the Syrias and Saddam's Iraq, uh, uh, the Iranians now uh, at, in this kind of destabilizing set of relationships. Man, much of it is historic too. It's a uh, Sunni versus Shia, it's Persian versus Arab, uh, you know, so there's a lot to uh, the historic roots of, of uh, uh, the kinds of animosities that created the, the situations that we have that present destabilizing uh, results in the, in the region. And some of it is historic in ways that are interesting in that there's family rivalries, you know, the United Arab Emirates and the Qatar a lot of the problems that they have have deep roots in family issues and problems that went back a ways. Same with the Saudis in Qatar. Uh, they go back to Abdul Aziz. They go back to a, di a different period. Uh, the UAE and Iran over the, the Shah taking uh, 
uh, the UAE islands, uh, Abu Musa and the lesser and greater tombs uh, that the UAE still claims and has legitimate claim to being uh, UAE uh, owned islands. And uh, obviously that, that sticks in the craw over time in history too. So, you know, specifically Syria, like uh, many of the potential hegemons in the region, uh, you know, they have been uh, the reason for a lot of disruption, violence, and destabilization. Thank you, General Zinni. I know, Ambassador, you spent over 50 years involved in Syria. Um, can you comment on, you know, do you also agree with the general that Syria is, has become a pariah? And it, again, the, the effect of the uh, Assad regimes. Can you comment on that, sir? Well, I think that uh, the general has, a, has the, the right slant on, on the, the impact of, of Syria in, in the region. Uh, I remember when Secretary Schultz uh, at one of those pivot points uh, decided that we could make peace without Syria and, uh, and sort of um, worked on a, uh, on a uh, plan that would not include the Syrians but would include Palestinians and so on. And he discovered that that wasn't possible. Uh, it, it, that the Syrians were very much a part of any kind of solution and would be very much a part of any kind of solution. And not just because of the Golan Heights, uh, although the Golan Heights are uh, a, a very important aspect of it, but uh, Syrians are, uh, are, are very interesting people. Uh, they, they are, uh, for example, most Syrians are not Alawites, uh, although the ruling dynasty is Alawite, small, uh, a rather small percentage of the Syrian population is, is Alawite. Hafez al-Assad was respected by most of the people in Syria because they thought he had uh, uh, English blood. He was a, a person who thought before he acted and who, when he gave his word, he held it. Well, it, you look at Syria and you see that Syria is a perfect place for proxies uh, to operate uh, and uh, push the agenda of other countries. As we speak now, Iran is operating a proxy war in Syria. Uh, there have been uh, various elements of uh, the of, of Palestinian organizations that have been used as proxies in Syria. Um, but whatever the, uh, the, the, the reality is, uh, as far as the Syrian objectives are concerned, we have to deal with Syria. And there is uh, no way that we can reach a, uh, a workable peace solution without the Syrian involvement. So I wanted to ask again, both of you about the role of the Palestinians and sort of historically and, and where you see that today. Can I start with you, Ambassador? Well, I think that the, my take on it after all these years is that the, for the rest of the Arab world, Palestine is a great cause but they don't necessarily like Palestinians. And that, is, that has, uh, has come up uh, more than, than once in my career. I remember going to the Syrians after the, the uh, Gulf War, going to the uh, Qataris and saying, listen, don't mistreat your Palestinians. <laughs> don't fire them and send them back home because they were, played a, a key role in various ways in the, uh, in the economy, but we didn't want to see uh, the, another uh, Palestinian wave of 
uh, disenfranchisement. And uh, basically I was told, well, you must know what kind of corruption and graft is involved with the Palestinians and the money uh, that we send them is a you know, very small percentage actually gets to Palestinian people. And uh, I, I just threw up my hands and said, uh, you, you know more than we do. <laughs> but in any case, I think that, you know, the, the poor Palestinians have, have, uh, uh, have suffered for a, a number of reasons. One is that they are very well educated historically. Uh, they look down on other, uh, on, on other Arabs. Uh, they have uh, uh, made their, uh, their mark in the Gulf. And, uh, and so re resources of uh, various kinds have come from the Gulf to other, other countries through the Palestinian channel. And people don't like that. Uh, they don't like the impact the impact, the influence that that can have. I think that, you know, the, the, my final conclusion after all these years is that it's a great cause for the Arab world. It's an essential cause for the Arab world. But that doesn't mean they like the Palestinians. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. And I, <clears throat> General Zinni, I know from our previous conversations that your role, uh, some of your thoughts on Palestine and also your interaction with uh, Yasser Arafat. So tell, tell me your thoughts on the Palestinian situation, sir. Well, I think the, the Palestinians' ability to gain support and to be able to come to the bargaining table from a position of, of, of strength has always been difficult. And right now it's probably, uh, there's probably a case to be made that they're feeling abandoned. Uh, more and more the issues that are concerned to them are being taken away, preempted and facts on the ground are changing them. Uh, there are many different interpretations of what the final status issues are, the issues that must be resolved. And, I think every envoy that's been out there and every secretary of state and uh, everybody on the ground has had a different set. I felt that there were 10 issues that you would have to uh, resolve uh, to get anywhere near any kind of peace accord. The first one is, is the question of Palestinian statehood. What does that mean? Uh, you know, the Israelis had talked about supporting two-state solution, but the sovereign state of Palestine or whatever it is, would not have uh, military forces. Palestinians, they really didn't want them, but they felt that's a sovereign issue. So again, if it's a two-state solution, what does sovereignty mean to a Palestinian state? The second is uh, the importance of the region to recognize uh, the Jewish state of Israel. Now you've had a couple of countries do that now based on the Abraham Accords. Uh, uh, but that would have to be region wide. As the ambassador said, very important that Syria be involved for a lot of reasons. So you can't have peace on a bilateral basis. You have to have it on a multilateral regional basis. This has to be a peace. It's not only between Israelis and Palestinians, but Arabs and I Israelis as well. The status of Jerusalem, which is extremely difficult because of religious and historic claims on the city, an unwillingness to, to think of some sort of formula for sharing. Uh, the right of return and refugees, uh, uh, which I think could be worked out in many ways, but it's going to take some principles to be negotiated in very subtle ways, like uh, compensation uh, for waiving the right, uh, where Israelis are saying you never had the right, Palestinians said, yes, I have. So there has to be some agreement to disagree if you can find a compensatory way to agree with it. Settlements, which continue to grow and grow and grow and making the West Bank look like Swiss cheese, uh, how that gets resolved is gonna be a very difficult problem. The question of borders, 
1967, the UN set borders. Those are long gone. Uh, the borders keep changing and shifting, but again, going back to, to settlements and other arrangements. There were times maybe in Camp David when Ehud Barak had put some formulas on the table that might have been close to uh, establishing a new set of borders that would have been seen as, as, as fair if, uh, to both sides, but I don't think that can happen today. I think the question of security, uh, what does that mean? How is it guaranteed? How is it insured? If there was a peace agreement, would we have UN peacekeepers on the ground? You know, uh, obviously the, the two populations are going to be intermixed. Obviously Israel's over 20% uh, uh, Arab uh, and, and Palestinian. The issues of water, uh, controlling the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan and the water becomes critical to both sides. Who has control? How is it distributed? Uh, the, the ambassador brought up the Golan Heights and the Leb Lebanon, the Shaba Farms, which now have been totally claimed by Israel, but still has uh, claims by Syria and Lebanon. And then the final issue, which I know people like Shimon Perez and other, others work hard at trying to resolve and maybe use as a, as, as a motivator to move further on the other issues is economic cooperation. Uh, th there is a natural, I think, economic link between the two. Uh, you, you know, Israel was paying a fortune in, in veg vegetables and, and produce that the Palestinians were producing for very cheap rates. Uh, the Palestinian workers were required uh, uh, in, in the Israeli territories where they didn't have enough of them. Uh, and so there has to be some sort of economic cooperation, uh, I think, between the two, especially since the populations are, are so mixed. Uh, a one-state solution, that's difficult because the Israelis see the birth rate working against them in the long run, and no one can figure out how you get a cooperative government. Uh, it violates sort of the, the Jewish state of Israel uh, designation, so it's difficult to, to move in, uh, in, in, in that way for some sort of single state solution. Um, there's been talk of parts of the West Bank then being uh, uh, annexed by Jordan and becoming part of Jordan. Jordanians want no part of that. Very poor country, tough existence, already has are loaded with refugees, beginning with Palestinians, then Iraqis, then Syrians. Uh, and they're in extreme difficulty uh, economically, and that would be more of a burden than, than any kind of advantage for them. So I would say now there's no peacekeepers on the, or peacemakers on the horizon. There's no interest I see from the United States to get deeply involved in a mediation process anymore. Uh, I think the ambassador hit on uh, issues about regional views of the Palestinians. Let me say the Palestinians have eight universities in their territory. Their biggest export was people. And as the ambassador pointed out, you went through the Gulf and you looked at the, the lawyers and you looked at the economic advisors. They tended to be Palestinian in, in the past. That, a lot of that has changed now as you know, universities had developed in the Gulf and elsewhere and they're trying to home grow their own and uh, you know, not have just a, an upper, upper crust that... Uh, uh, lives off the uh, uh, land and brings in expats. Uh, but the Palestinians are, are, are not a, as someone said to me, they were surprised to realize that the Palestinians were not a beggar society. Well, if you know your history and you understand the region, you would know that's exactly the opposite is true. Yeah. No, again, th thank you for elaborating all, all, all of that, General Zinni. Ambassador, obviously, General impacted a lot of information there. What sort of stood out to you, sir? Well, I think the uh, what as I listen to General Zinni, I, I'm, my mind is cast back to uh, various times when I sort of dipped into the peace process uh, structure, and I was always surprised that uh, although he listed those ten items that were uh, roadblocks to us to a solution, there always seemed to be an understanding on both sides of the negotiators what a, a final solution would look like. Uh, very important was a lot of money from the United States. 
as a part of the, uh, of the right of return and compensation and so on. Uh, there, there were even ideas that seemed to be agreeable on both sides of the negotiators uh, about the status of Jerusalem. I emphasize negotiators because over the years, uh, a set of negotiators, a set of people, experts uh, on both sides got to know each other uh, and in that region of the world, personal contact is extremely important. Uh, and, and so they had, I believe, uh, the, the groundwork for something that, that could work. But what was necessary was the courage to put that forward to their populations. And, and to this day, uh, we have seen nobody, none of the leaders, uh, take that kind of risk to move the process forward, with the exception, of course, of Anwar Sadat's historic visit uh, to Israel. Yeah, if I could add something, uh, Adam. Sure. Uh, there's never been a problem with getting peace agreements. We have the Geneva Accords, the Oslo Accords, we have Madrid, Camp David Accords. Uh, the problem's always been implementing and, uh, them. No one could figure out how to make it work on the ground. Uh, you know, the, the Geneva Accords was an effort by two of the leaders of, of peace factions on both sides, uh, uh, Yossi Bellin and Yasser Rabo, uh, that, have, that have pretty senior positions in their government, have had had them you know, at the Knesset level and a uh, member of Arafat's uh, inner circle. Uh, and they just took every agreement that had been worked and put it all together and said, there it is. I mean, there's the, here's what everybody's agreed to. Uh, let's just implement it. And, it, it. and if you need to know if it'll work, let's put a referendum out to the people on both sides to see if they would accept it. It could not move to that level. So the problem is in how do you make it work on the ground? I think every one of the issues, you can come up with a formula. Both sides have to give something. There has to be compromise. Uh, it's not one-sided. Uh, I, I get a kick out of people that keep telling me why the why don't the Palestinians just you know agree to everything? Well, why did the Israelis agree to some things too? And and I'm not you know and you could reverse that as well. Uh, you know both sides ha have issues with uh, uh, viewing who should be giving the mo the most and uh, what it's based on. I mean, yeah, first of all, you have Issues that you cannot negotiate, birthright and religion. You know, those, I've done 12, 12 peace mediation efforts in my lifetime. And there are things that you can work with, like security and borders and land and all that stuff. But when you start to get into, you know, I, I am a chosen people. No, you know, Muhammad rose to the seventh level of heaven from Jerusalem. No, this is where the promised land was and, you know, where, you know, Moses came to the edge of the Jordan, Jordan River and his brother Aaron crossed over and we arrived at the land of milk and honey. How do you negotiate that? You know, I mean, so that, that therein lies not the whole problem, but certainly the roots of the problem. No, th thank you, General Zinni. And sort of final question for today, if I could. Tell me about, and I'll start with you, Ambassador, in terms of the West, and in, in particular, the United States, Americans, Amer the American people, our view of the Middle East. What do you think that is? And if there's something wrong there, how do we change it? Well, uh... The Arabs have, have not been very good in public relations over the years. And uh, the image in the minds of many Americans is uh, hijacked jets and a crippled man in a, in a uh, wheelchair being pushed off the uh, Achille Laurel. Uh, I mean, and 
the, the kinds of, of, uh, of acts that uh, almost anybody would abhor. Those have been sort of the, the images of, uh, of the Arab world as far as many Americans are concerned. And the, the, the Arab world for its part has not pushed uh, forward the notion that they look for peace. They are looking for a, a peaceful solution that will do uh, some of the important things, render justice to the Palestinians. Yes, agree to the existence of Israel, uh, push for a, uh, a kind of economic cooperation that could be explosively good in that region between Israel and, and the Arab world. Uh, and uh, they, they just put forth an image, uh, a, a negative image over the years. Doesn't have to be that way, uh, but there seems to be built in uh, a sense that if we, uh, we change our uh, public relations face, they were somehow uh, giving up an important bargaining chip. And, and there we stand. Thank you, Ambassador. G General Zinni, sort of the, the image of the Middle East, the Arab world in America, and again, if, it's, if it is negative, how does that change, sir? Well, I think the image is uh, an, an unstable region, uh, tends to breed extremists, uh, it's mo uh, monarchical and it you know, doesn't allow for many democracies to flourish. Uh, so there's a lot of negative side to, I think, how Americans see it. But uh, one great thing about our country is we don't hold a grudge or we don't, we change our views of, from generation to generation. I mean, the beginning of our country, Washington warned about uh, entangling alliances and getting involved in a mess. And he was referring to Europe. You know, uh, at the end of every war, whoever we were fighting against and maybe had a lot of visceral negative and even hatred feelings toward uh, went away. I mean, today our allies are the Japanese, the Germans, you know, uh, all our adversaries in, in the Great War. Uh, I think that if stability in the Middle East were ever to be achieved, you know, if, if it became a place where uh, people thought of, as we do, say, Western Europe or uh, the Far East and places like that, that we visit, that, that you would see our attitudes here toward the Middle East change. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, Islamophobia that's present. There's a lot of misunderstanding about that part of the world, and uh, there's a lot, a lack certainly of, of, of understanding the historic roots of where it, 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 it has been. Uh, I think there are conflicts like the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, and in the past, the Israeli-Arab conflicts that generate a certain view depending on how you, you view the conflict from back here. But I don't think it's anything, I don't buy into the clash of civilizations theory you know, the Topplers saying that there's something automatically uh, at odds between one culture and another, one religion and another. I think if we could gain stability in this part of the world, we would treat them and see them and they would see us uh, as we have with past adversaries. Thank you, General Zinni. Um, Ambassador, do you have uh, one final comment, sir? Uh, only to say how... Uh, uh, fulfilling this kind of conversation is. And uh, I hope that uh, as, especially your experience in, in the negotiations, uh, General Zinni can be made more widely known. Well, th thank you for that, gentlemen. Um, on that note, I'm gonna say thank you very much. I hope that we can, uh, we can do this again. It's been absolutely fantastic, an honor and a privilege to get a chance to both of you. You both have a great day. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Adam. It's an honor to be with you, Ambassador. Same here, General.